the program, we shall be looking at another area of health. Universal health coverage is our focus. It is included within the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Universal health coverage is defined by the World Health Organization as all individuals having access to required health services of sufficient quality and without suffering financial hardship. Effective strategies for financing health care are critical towards achieving this goal, but this remains a challenge in sub-Saharan Africa. Appropriate health financing strategies that safeguard financial risk protection undermine sustainable health services and the attainment of universal health care. Today, we will tackle the challenge of access to quality health services, preventative or curative. What are those policies and strategies needed for our population to attain health and achieve healthy lifestyles? We will find answers. I am Lydia Ojiji Ochi. Thank you for joining us and we'll be back in a moment to stay. Before we continue on our topic, let's take our news update. The National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, NIPS Kuru, organized an administrative instruction session on the Intercontinental Study Tour for the Senior Executive Course 45 participants. The administrative function, which is aimed at providing officials and course participants with right. appropriate guidelines to ensure a smooth and successful intercontinental study tour, had in attendance Brigadier General C.F.J. Udaya, retired MNI, Secretary and Director of Administration, mm -hmm. Professor Fumi Paramalam, MNI, Director of Studies, Professor Pam Dusha, Director of Research, members of directing staff, research fellows, and course participants. While giving a detailed itinerary on the Intercontinental Study Tour, which is an integral part of the academic requirement for the senior executive course participants, Brigadier General CFJ Udaya retired MNI expressed his gladness over the successful preparation of the tour and applauded the Director General for making it possible. The Director of Studies, in her remarks, admonished course participants to display good conduct and absolute decorum. Flesh out a few things. Um, with respect to the issue of Esther Code, it was a very, very difficult decision for many women. It was squarely on the table as to whether or not to even scrap the, the tour, to go or not to go. But the consideration of management, and I think it's important that participants know, is that the value of the tour to this course, intercontinental tour, is it something that participants would come away with? with a very strong, positive experience. And we felt that at the end of the day, going on this... The participants who were divided into seven groups each will be visiting the United Kingdom, China, Ireland, Thailand, Germany, and the United States of America, respectively. The tour is expected to last one week. China Ijoga reporting for NIPS Policy TV. Thank you for staying with us. Back to our topic. Universal Health Coverage, UHC, included in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is defined by the World Health Organization as all individuals and communities having access to any health services they need of sufficient quality to be effective without suffering financial loss or hardship. With over 100 million people becoming impoverished annually due to catastrophic health expenditures, particularly in low and middle income countries, developing solutions is one or is of dire importance. To discuss this, joining me via Zoom is Dr. Stanley Upai. He is Director of Projects Development Research and Project Center, Abuja. Dr. Stanley, glad to have you again as our guest. Thank you very much. All right. 
Now, Dr. Stanley, the out-of-pocket expenditure as a percentage of total health cost in Nigeria is 74.7% as against a country like South Africa with 5.38% as at 2020. This is one of the highest in the world. What does this portray for our health system? Uh, firstly, I'd like to say um, a high out-of-pocket expenditure, you know, as a percentage of health costs in, in anywhere in the world, no, no less Nigeria, indicates uh, significant challenges within health systems. And I think some of the implications um, portion of healthcare costs in Nigeria are borne directly by uh, the citizens, individuals, and households. And this can result in, in financial hardship. Uh, uh, usually there's a saying um, in the development world that um, Nigerians are just one health catastrophe away from uh, of, from poverty. Um, and it, it is concerning. And high, high, high out-of-pocket expenditure suggests that um, health insurance coverage is inadequate. It's not provide you know so, sufficient uh, financial cover for for Nigerians a higher out of pocket expenditure also means that um you know spending is it will be disproportionately on those who cannot afford it and and you know these are some of the challenges that um you know a weak health system does does portray and when you try to look at um why this is you see that there is um it reflects a low uh, public funding for healthcare in Nigeria, and and with adequate funding and and proper insurance coverage, uh, out of pocket expenditure is expected to you know to be reduced. And these are some of the things that um, we um, working in this space have tried to uh, point out. Um, there is need for some form of health health systems reform to address high 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 out of pocket expenditure if we hope to expand uh, coverage to Nigerians in keeping with our mandate for achieving. I'm hoping that this sort of reflects, um, um, you know, needs and, and 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 areas that we need to be looking at, um, you know, for Nigerian health system. And and I do agree with you. It's one of the highest in the world um, at seventy something percent. Um, but but we can address these issues, and it re it, it needs a um, multifaceted approach by by government, civil society, private sector organisations, and that collaborative effort is what we need from various stakeholders to improve uh, healthcare access and reduce our out-of-pocket expenditure. The National Health Insurance Authority Act 2021 was intended to make states and employers to provide health insurance to all workers. This is a way of drastically reducing the astronomical out-of-pocket expenses by individuals. How will you assess the implementation of this act? Um, absolutely. Um, if you, and this is not being um, critical of government, but if you want to assess a thing, you look at the original plans for the intended uh, NHI, NHIA process. And one of which is looking at subjective, which is for the promotion, regulation and integration of health insurance schemes, um, also improving and harnessing private sector participation in the provision of healthcare services. Um, but more importantly, amongst a lot of other functions of the NHIA, the authority is supposed to secure mandatory health insurance for every Nigerian and legal resident and es establish a basic minimum package across health insurance providers in the country while providing general guidelines for the implementation of the basic healthcare provision fund. Uh, as a matter of fact, it goes on to say that uh, section Section 13 of the Act uh, provides for states of the Federal for the Federation and the FCT to establish and implement a state health insurance contributory scheme for the purpose of access um, to health. Now, benchmarking that and looking at what we we currently have, um, I'd say that the NHI has made significant strides. Um, a lot of the states already have their state contributory schemes um, up and running. But um, I think this has always been a challenge. And, and that, that, that is the fact that only a majority of um, uh, coverage is focused on the private sector, um, excluding, uh, is focused on the public sector, beg your pardon, excluding private sector and, and informal workers. And this has always been the challenge of the NHI, how to capture um, the private sector workers and uh, 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 and informal workers, uh, you know, for the for the public sector, they are already within that 
scheme and the government just um, supports the process to facilitate it. But for private sector and informal workers, uh, NHIA needs to uh, improve um, it, you know, its ability to convince them that this is a, a journey worth making. And in that bit, they have not been able to move the dial uh, from their coverage. There has been significant stride, and I think most of the significant stride is because of the public coverage. But regarding private sector and um, and and uh, informal sector, there's still there's more that needs to be done. And if Nigeria is to achieve some of its targets regarding universal health coverage, these are some of the things that we need to start looking at, um, you know, for for health facilities, uh, third party administrators and, and all of those bits. So so at, at this point, we are not at the point where we should be as a country, but I think we have made significant strides um, and the NHIA has done so much in uh, legitimizing the process uh, by, by creating information, making the, the, the process as open and accountable as possible. But then government still has to um, want to do this. And, you know, that scope for coverage is, some, is, is, is an area where we must improve on if, uh, you know, the rural women, the rural people should would be covered and even the hard to reach. And I think that's where... Uh, the gap is and the challenge is. Uh, so if I were to assess them, it's good, but we can do better. Dr. Stanley, your organization was part of the stakeholders that contributed significant, significantly to the passage of the National Health Act and the National Health Policy. What would you say are the main strengths of both the act and the policy? This is, this is a good question. I think it's quite... Um, one that requires reflection. The National Health Act and the National Health Policy for me have uh, several strengths and, and these strengths contribute to the country's healthcare system. Um, if you look at the National Health Act, it provides a comprehensive legal framework for, um, for the organization and financing and regulation of health services in Nigeria. It also establishes that clear gu guideline uh, for the provision of various aspects of the health system, including health financing, health emergencies and research. Uh, and one of the key strengths of this act is the establishment of the Basic Healthcare Provision Fund. And with, with this fund, it aims to provide um, sort of like a financial resource base for the provision of basic minimum package, which is essential if um, we're to reduce out-of-pocket expenditure, especially for the vulnerable and the underserved uh, population. And, and this ensures uh, that a portion of the national budget is dedicated to primary health care services. 1% um, of the consolidated revenue fund, as this fondly said. Uh, the Act also emphasizes uh, Nigeria's need to strengthen health systems. It focuses on key areas like the human resources for health, infrastructure, uh, even uh, development of health information systems, you know, and quality improvement and i think by addressing those areas nigeria can um, improve its capacity or to efficiently deliver health systems. Um, and this is not uh, forgetting the health emergency and prepared response that the Act does uh, provide for. And in comparison to the health policy, uh, the health policy sort, sort of um, takes a comprehensive and holistic approach to uh, healthcare in Nigeria. And it addresses a wide range of issues, uh, including preventive, promotive, uh, curative, and even rehabilitative care. And, and this is... Um, sort of like an overarching um, mindset towards um, revisioning health. And, and one of the strengths of this policy is the fact that it addresses equity. Um, I don't think um, Nigeria can achieve uh, universal health um, um, coverage if we don't put equity and access at the back of our mind. And, and this is where um, a lot of um, implementers sort of um, um, align on, because unlike equality, equality is providing health service for all. But when you talk about equity, you're looking at addressing everybody's needs where they are. And, and you know, the health policy does um, emphasize on equitable access for healthcare for Nigeria. It also pitches um, its tent on, on, on public-private partnership as well as improving community participation. These strengths are, are things that I think, um, you know, both the National Health Act and the National Health Policy provides, um, and, and that this strength provides that foundation for Nigeria to be able to launch into um, majority or any health agenda that it does put forward. All right. Looking at the health targets of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, are they feasible? So um, I guess we are 
a few years too far gone to be talking about um, <laughs> feasibility. Maybe if the, the conversation around feasibility should have started a long, but, but at, you know, the SDG goals 2030 agenda, they were ambitious, but feasible at the time, especially if um, there, there were concerted efforts from government, um, civil society organization, international partners, even the global community. And, and I, I think the targets are things that have bearings uh, of which some of those things, Nigeria, we were hedging from some of the worst indicators. Our maternal mortality rate was was terrible. Our um, child mortality rate, infant mortality rate, very, 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 very terrible. And, you know, some of the targets that were quite ambitious but they were doable at the time. And, and you know, things like commitment from government, um, the global community have already committed to this process. And, and you can see it from some of the international aid that comes in to um, address some of these health um, um, related issues. So, so there is global commitment. Um, Gavi came in and signed um, a, a commitment with Nigeria on, on vaccination and, and helping Nigeria move into a state where Nigeria can uh, transition into financing its own um, uh, vaccine process. Um, th there's been so many commitments from um, government. Even Nigeria is not left out. We have made progress regarding some of the policy commitments. We signed the um, London 2012 commitment uh, to improve contraceptive in a bid to reduce maternal mortality. Um, we recently signed last year um, the FP2030 commitment, which allowed um, state governments to um, allocate 1% of their health budget to family planning in a bid to reduce maternal mortality. There's been a lot of programs and, and even, uh, I dare say, multi-sectoral approaches to, to this process. Um, these are some of the concerted efforts that I, I think, if we had started from the beginning, would have helped us achieve uh, some of the targets. And, you know, one big issue that has remained was the perennial issue of financing. So we've not been able to achieve uh, the Abuja declaration. And the Abuja declaration stated that we were to, um, you know, allocate 15% of our budget to health. And without funding, a lot of all of these processes would suffer. So achieving the 2030 agenda, there's still some uh, seven years to go. But we have to bear down at this point to address some of those issues. So we have the policy commitment. We need to back it up with a financial commitment. And and kudos to the Tinubu administration. Um, in the last four to five years, we've never gone past 5% of our total budget for health. But Mr. Tinubu has said that um, in 2024, we're going to hit 10%. And, and these are some of the steps that when government begins to take, um, we can begin to see changes in the indices. We can begin to see changes in some of those indices that have prevented us from achieving our maternal uh, our mortality rate target, our child mortality rate target, even vaccine coverage target. And those are the things that um, you know we look to achieve um, in, in, in the end. So feasibility, it, it's still possible, but there is a need for concerted effort by a very many um, um, stakeholders. Uh, Dr. Stanley, what, what is your opinion of external funding? And do you think this can be used to turn around funding of health in Nigeria? So I'm, I'm always very wary around external funding, you know, such as foreign aids, grants, loans, even partnerships. Um, but I do understand that they can significantly address funding gaps and improve healthcare in Nigeria, excuse me. So external funding can produce um, additional, you know, financial resources and to supplement our domestic healthcare budget. You know, Nigeria in the last four years we have um, tried our, our very best to tunnel ourselves out of a, a recession, and you know, with external funding, it can help provide that extra launch pad that can expand uh, and improve healthcare infrastructure, service delivery, strengthen our health systems, as well as address some of the access issues to essential health services. So, external funding is particularly um, valuable in in a sort of resource constrained uh, settings, just just like ours. But and external funding can also be used to target specific um, health programs, initiatives that align with our health priorities. Um, so we're talking about maternal mortality being very terrible. With external funding, we've been able to do a lot. So 
regarding family planning contraceptive, Nigeria signed up to um, a counterpart funding mechanism where money is put into baskets, and Nigeria pledged to put in $4 million every year since 2017, 2012, 2017, to put in $4 million. And, and external funding does come in to complement that basket so that we are able to achieve, um, you know, to, to, to purchase uh, contraceptive commodities that help us um, achieve our contraceptive prevalence rate target and in, in, in turn manage our population, reduce maternal mortality and, you know, help the women, um, you know, focus on other, other things. And, and this is some of the benefits of external funding. And usually when external funding comes, sometimes it comes with um, ex external uh, technical expertise and, and that knowledge transfer can benefit our health system. So external funding is not all bad and external funding can serve as a catalyst uh, for as a catalyst investment for for domestic investment because if external funding comes in and finances for example family planning and we see that um our population is more quality than quantity then it tells us that if domestic funding is put into this 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 place um we can achieve a lot more so these are some of the things that we that that are the benefits of financial um, external funding but it's, it's important to note that external funding should be seen as complementary rather than a substitute and, and i think this is the um drawback that we have come to see as as reality in nigeria so because external funding is funding um for example family planning um, we then remove domestic funding and reprioritize it where there is no funding, which sort of makes economic sense. But it then takes off um, that responsibility, that fiscal responsibility for where we should be strengthening and leaving it to external funding. And, and this is where the red flags don't then come in. So we then become over-reliant on that external funding to 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 um, sort of solve the vulnerabilities that we, we have in our... And it, it is, we know, as we know now, that is subject to uh, donor priority. Can you educate us on some innovative financing approaches? When I think about innovative um, financing approaches, um, I think what comes to mind is mostly um, bonds, and there are several types of bonds. Um, you know, social impact bonds, development impact bonds, health health impact bonds, and and these bonds, especially social impact bonds, form like a pay for success uh, financing where private investors can provide upfront funding uh, for social programs um, and interventions, and if the outcomes, the predefined and agreed outcomes are achieved, then there is um, a payout to the private sector organization. Uh, and the same thing for development impact bonds. They're they are similar and they focus on development projects, uh, including areas in healthcare. And, and um, talk, not to talk more about um, a health impact bonds, which is also um, you know, similar to social impact and development impact bonds. Um, there are also different types of um, uh, mechanisms like the resource based financing and you know where uh, payments are made based on achievement for predefined um, outputs or results uh, and it involves um, whatever partnership that brings in um, funding to specific health outcomes and and you know government and private sector even um, individuals and and another example is um, like the car covid which is a sort of um, crowdfunding mechanism where a, a platform is is created to raise awareness about an issue and people can um, provide funding for one uh, particular issue. And we saw that during the COVID-19 uh, period. And this platform of individuals, organizations contributed financially um, um, to address a specific issue. Dr. Stanley, in your opinion, what do you think should be done to ensure quality health services reach some of the most vulnerable communities in Nigeria? If we address physical infrastructure, and, and we, you know, with, with the insurgency, a lot of the physical um, infrastructure has been destroyed, have been abandoned, and all of that. So once we begin to address those issues um, by upgrading those facilities, especially in remote and underserved areas, um, even thinking about things like mobile clinics, um, to get closer to these people, we'll begin to ensure um, that we're making um, um, a headway with reaching some of the vulnerable 
conditions. Also, I think strengthening primary health care services is a very key issue. Primary health care services like the frontier, is like the front line of health care delivery. And this can be done by um, not just training, but deploying more community health workers, nurses, midwives, even doctors to provide essential health services in those areas. A considerable challenge is the dependency on donor funding and also developing effective strategies to strengthen domestic financing mechanisms. How can we overcome this challenge? I think the Nigerian government should prioritize healthcare financing and make it top of its policy agenda. And and you know, if you look at the agenda from Mr. President, I think this 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 has been um, also topical. And this involves committing uh, to allocate sufficient uh, percentage of our national health budget to the health sector, as recommended by the Abuja Declaration. And and this commitment helps to build not just trust but confidence in the health uh, system. Uh, this is something that we. We must do as the first past effect. Mm -hmm. Also, we need to start to think of um, strategies to increase resource mobilization. And, and government is looking at some of those strategies. Um, I, I know there is an economic committee that was formed to look at taxation and all of those bits. And this can uh, generate you know, extra revenue to be allocated to um, um, other issues as well as health financing. Thank you, Dr. Stanley Pai, for providing insight on this topic. And thank you for being our guest once again. I'm happy to be here. Thank you to have contributed to this process. Keep watching. Keep watching. Keep watching NIPS Policy TV. Generally, um, health financing is really a huge problem, especially in the middle and low-income countries, just like um, Nigeria. We have a lot of problems that concern the um, health financing because most of the time, our health sector is um, grossly underfunded, and that is um, majorly because of the lack of government um, will to prioritize um, health, which is um, a very important aspect of um, human life. But, um, well, as a health practitioner, we try to make use of um, the little resources that we have in order to ensure that we give um, good um, health care to the population that we serve. So here at the medical center, um, we, it's, um, the medical center is under the National Health Insurance um, Scheme. So it's an insurance um, scheme which um, various workers contribute um, from their salaries in order to finance health and then to help one another. That's the essence of the National Health Insurance um, Scheme. The institute is really a large community. And a good number of those that are on the campus are not on the National Health Insurance Scheme. So the Director General of the National Institute in his magnanimity and then using his wisdom um, suggested that we create a non-NHIS revolving scheme, which is a scheme that he funded in order to help those that are not under the scheme to also assess health care within the National Institute. So what we do is that when anybody within the Institute can come, the consultation is usually free, but then the drugs that they are supposed to get are given to them at a very cheap rate. So that would enable them also get the necessary you know, health that coverage that they need. So I think that's has really gone a long way in ensuring that most of the people that are within the National Institute are properly covered in terms of the health care. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the federal government uh, actually introduced National Health Insurance Scheme, which uh, happens to be a member, of, I'm a registered member as well, um, an enrollee of the National Health Insurance Scheme, and um, it's very beneficial. 
Uh, why is it beneficial? Is because uh, if you are you've been a member of the National Health Insurance Scheme, if you come for treatment, they will only charge you 10%, which is very okay. Unlike if you are not a member, you might, they might charge you 100%. And um, one, good, one important thing with the National Insurance Scheme is this. Once you have your number, there's a, there's a particular number, being a registered member, if you have it anywhere you find yourself within the country, any state at all, you can. Once you present the, your number, National Insurance Scheme number to them, they will put it in their computer, it will come up, then you will have your treatment. Or that, they will charge you 10%. So that's one of the... Uh, important thing with uh, the National Insurance Scheme program. Yeah, uh, really we have, not everyone is privileged to be on the National Health Insurance Scheme. So, thank God with uh, our EBU uh, Director General, he came up with this idea, like thinking, you know, we've been having a lot of problems, people will be coming on the side. We have a lot of patients that they are not uh, NHIS. That is, they are non-NHIS outside. You know, sometimes to purchase the drug outside may be very expensive, and some patients cannot afford it, you understand? So, but with this new community, he brought this idea to us that at least this drug revolving fund, you understand? So that any patient that is coming, we don't need to be writing out drugs for them out. We we'll have our drug revolving the drawer that the drugs we sell for them. We we'll consult them. They don't even pay consultation fee. We consult them and then we we'll ask them to pay some certain amount of charges. You understand? At least affordable charges they can pay. And since then, at least it's, we are doing very well with that uh, system. You understand? Even some of the staff here, you know, it's not all drugs. Some antibiotics and some anti malaria, as you understand, they are very expensive. It's not covered in the NHS. So, some of our NHS that have that prescription that it's not covered in the NHS, we do even advertise it. And they have been patronizing us, the staff too, the drugs that we need, and it's not in the NHS. We do, we buy too from there, and at least it's really helping. Really, thank God for that. It's really challenging, but uh, you know. For health issue, you have to take it serious because of being the head of a family. If you don't take it so serious and the engine got knocked, means you will have yourself to be blamed. So for that, I used to search for money. First thing, uh, in the that is first thing in the year, I will search for money and go for general body checkup. After that. I will receive all the medication they will give me, then I will hold on again. Last thing in the last, that is last thing at the end of the year again, I will go again for another general body checkup to see what are the challenges. This is what I do every year. Government should render assistance to the less privileged just the way they are doing to palliative issue. They should render assistance by giving a turkey to those that are less privileged to go for checkup. Or they can even give uh, an order to some specific hospital for the less privileged to go for that very particular checkup.
Today, our guest on Alumni Chat is a very special person. First of all, she's a woman, a beautiful, hardworking one at that. She's someone we all admire here at the National Institute. 
I'm talking about Professor Fumi Paramala, the Director of Studies. Thank you for joining us, ma'am. Thank you for having me. And we appreciate that you found time, despite your busy schedule, to have this interview with us. Thank you so much. Now, Professor, tell us what was your experience when we were here at the Institute as a participant? Wow, that's a long time ago. So I was a participant on SEC 35, 2013, 10 years ago precisely. It was a, a very enriching experience. I came out of that experience thinking that, wow, it was so intense and uh, probably <laughs> almost more intense than my PhD because I spanned over, you know, three years. It was a very, very intensive course. It was rewarding, but stretching. Um, it helped in so many ways to expose me to a deeper knowledge about the nation, uh, the issues, uh, you know, critical issues of national import, but also to network with a whole variety of um, colleagues and friends and acquaintances across different, you know, um, divides. How has the experience imparted in your life as a person and in your career? You know, being an MNI has its own perks. And, you know, one of them is that it opens opportunities uh, for you in terms of being considered even for appointments. So I believe that even this particular office that I hold, uh, being an MNI stood me in good stead or in better stead to be considered for the, for the role. And then, like I was talking earlier about the network of colleagues and acquaintances that you come across, you know, that helps you to be able to tap into a huge human resource. And even as director of studies, I have been able to reach out and tap into that resource, bringing some of the uh, alumni here uh, for, to deliver you know, lectures, to participate in seminars. Just recently, we had the Distinguished Alumni Lecture Series. And this year's was delivered by engineer Mohammed Gambo, MNI. And it was just, you know, he came here for a visit just to call on us and, uh, and listening to him, I realized that what he had done, what he was doing aligned with our theme for the year. So I said, oh, you should be our distinguished alumni lecture, lecturer this year. And that's, you know, how that happened. So, you know, being able to tap into that network of, of people has been very helpful. And then, you know, the standard to which we are held, the motto of uh, Annie is towards a better society. So I believe that's always at the back of one's mind, that as a member of the National Institute, you are constantly supposed to be working, wherever you are placed, towards a better society. My philosophy in life is do your best. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your heart. Do, do it to the best of your ability. Not because somebody is watching, not because there's somebody is going to pat you on the back or give you a reward, but because you know you are working for a higher purpose. What would be your reaction about the narrative that the alumni is an elitist group? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being elitist. <laughs> um, an elite has their purpose in society. Very often change and transformation are driven by the elite. Um, it is only when the elite do not understand that their position is a sacred trust that you now have that it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. If the elite are alive to their responsibility, that being elite, an elite is only an opportunity to serve, only an opportunity to raise up the rest of humanity. Every position is only an opportunity and God will ask us what we have mm -hmm. done with it. So if, if people are saying that Annie is elitist, to me it's, it's, it's not a, a bad label to be elitist, except if elitist now becomes exclusive, discriminatory, uh, and un unconcerned about the rest. Then when it is that, then it's a problem. How impactful has the association been to the Institute? Okay, in terms of the impact of Annie on the National Institute, well, it's, I would say it's a mixed bag in the sense that there has been some impact uh, in terms of Annie recognizing that this is the alma mater and um, coming back 
to have uh, the AGM and, and the annual general meetings. And um, now that we that the Director General of the National Institute, when he came in in 2022, he instituted the Distinguished Alumni Lecture Series. And that has been a really good platform for getting people to come and you know give back to their alma mater. And we've had some of our, in fact, quite a number of uh, our alumni coming back to give lectures. Uh, some even at their own expense coming to meet with participants. We had that especially um, year before last, you know, and last year. That that really helps. And um, I would also say showing an interest in the National Institute, uh, what's happening there, wanting to make sure that the standards are still being kept high. Um, Annie is very committed to ensuring that, you know, NIPS doesn't uh, derail from, you know, its mandate. So that's good. But I said it's a mixed bag because the impact could be much more. Much more if, for example, uh, when, when people are in session, when they're on course, they always have what we call legacy projects. Mm. And these are very nice legacy projects. For example, Sec 40, uh, Sec 45 is building a training center for the Directorate of Studies. Um, we also have last year, Sec 44 built uh, a primary school. And year before then, Sec 43 built a whole set of offices for directing staff. So we've had some very, very groundbreaking um, projects, legacy projects. But then when they're gone, they're gone. And so sometimes not looking back to keep tabs on those projects, how are they faring, uh, is there any scaling up, is there any, you know, whatever that needs to be, to be done. Just to even show an interest, like you have uh, endowments abroad where alumni come and they are constantly trying to see how they can feed back into the alma mater to improve through these endowments. And so I think we need an alumni endowment uh, or the alumni participate in the NIPS endowment much more closely. Um, I think that would be really, really useful. And I, and I also think that the senior executive course participants could benefit a whole lot more from mentoring mm -hmm. from people who have passed out. You know of, of the course so maybe we need to set up a maybe a better system you know for that to happen but we have the alumni um, the alumni platform now uh, that was uh, established professor Adin Oju MNI is also in charge of that and I think that's going to be a veritable platform for cementing further cementing the relationship between the alumni and the National Institute now, Professor, what were the circumstances that led to you becoming the Director of Studies? Well, I think that is, is uh, something for my memoirs. Mm. But uh, I could uh, maybe hint at a, one or two things. Uh, you know, before now, we didn't really have a situation where uh, a long-standing staff had risen through the ranks to become a management staff. And for a while, um, there had been that agitation that NIPS should be a place where people can come and grow, and grow to the highest you know, position. Thank you, Professor Fumi Paramalam, for finding time to talk with us. It's really been an interesting chat. Thank you so much. We're grateful for sharing your insight and your thoughts with us. Thank you indeed. Thank you for having me, God and I bless. wish you the best with this uh, uh, Policy TV. I'm so happy for this initiative that the DG has brought on board. Mm -hmm. It's an idea that whose time has come. And that's our chat today. We hope you had a nice time watching that. The program continues. Don't go away. Stay with us. Keep watching, keep watching, keep watching NIPS Policy TV.
it's new it's fresh it's all about policies and strategies watch out for nips policy tv programs on nta news 24 tune in on mondays tuesdays fridays and saturdays 11 a.m to 12 p.m on dstv channel 419 go tv channel 26 star times channels 101 and 433 and free tv channel 703 miss this and miss out on policies that will affect you and our country join us healthcare access and quality remain a challenge worldwide not only in nigeria and efforts to improve these issues through universal health care are pivotal. Concerted efforts at various levels between local governments, donors, and private sectors will be necessary to provide resources targeted for vulnerable population groups. Communicating returns on investments to donors and considering priority investment areas while sustaining financing commitments to support countries to provide basic health care remains critical. That is on the program today. Hope you have been well enlightened on universal health care. And thank you for being a part of this. I am Lydia Otijiochi. See you next time. Goodbye.